Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum teacher, intuitive guide, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This podcast is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts and ideas validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. Whether you are listening to this show while driving or commuting, doing chores around the house, relaxing on a couch, or flying in a spaceship across the galaxy, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Whether you are aware of this or not, we have entered the quantum age. We are living the information age not as a matter of choice, but necessity, as what we knew yesterday, broadly speaking, no longer applies today in the context of our evolution and understanding of the true nature of reality. In this episode, I'd like to explore how the quantum knowledge and understanding of our reality which was buried with the demise of ancient highly evolved civilizations like Atlantis and Lemuria for thousands of years and was rediscovered only recently with science, can improve our life experience and empower us. I'm thrilled to introduce to you my returning guest, Cynthia Sue Larson, who will join me in this special quantum conversation. Cynthia is the best-selling author of several books, including Quantum Jumps, Reality Shifts, and High Energy Money, and the creator and host of Living the Quantum Dream podcast. She has a degree in physics from UC Berkeley, an MBA degree, a Doctor of Divinity qualification, and is the founder of Reality Shifters. She has been featured on numerous shows, including Gaia, The History Channel, Coast to Coast AM, One World with Deepak Chopra, and BBC. You will find more information about Cynthia in her guest bio on my podcast website at quantumlivingpodcast.com. I spoke with Cynthia in our first interview, Quantum Jumps, published earlier this year. It was immensely popular, but it was just a warm-up for this conversation, as you will soon find out. So make yourself comfy and enjoy. Hello, Cynthia. Welcome back to Quantum Living. It's so great to be speaking with you again on my show. Thank you so much, Anna. I'm so happy to be with you again. Love the questions that you ask and the topics that you raise. Beautiful. Thank you. You know, I usually leave the essence of my podcast topic, which is often its title, until the end, to allow it emerge as the final conclusion, even if it's in the realm of possibilities. This time, I'd like to open our conversation with it as the center point we will be coming back to. So, let's talk about the quantum age. I will also be sharing several quotes from your amazing book, Quantum Jumps, which I find simply exquisite, and I don't use this term lightly. And the quotes I have selected are important for our conversation to unfold. Speaking of your book... (laughs) I would also like to share a personal quantum jump experience (laughs) with this very book, in fact. Not long ago, I was preparing for an interview with another guest, and I wanted to read their book beforehand. As there was no time to order a hard copy book, I decided to get it on Kindle, which was apparently available. Around that time, we have also agreed to do another interview with you, And I was thinking of getting your Quantum Jams book as well. I haven't been accessing my Kindle library for about seven years. (laughs) I just didn't, didn't have the time. I vaguely remembered that I had purchased few books in about 2012 or 2014, but nothing since then. In the meantime, I also bought a new computer about three years ago, and I never bothered to reinstall Kindle on it. So I went to Amazon and purchased a Kindle edition of that book by my new guest. And to read it, I had to reinstall the Kindle app on my new computer, 
When I clicked on the library, I saw there 16 books, amongst them Quantum Jumps. I was stunned. I definitely don't recall purchasing this book. It's not free, and I certainly haven't read it. So how did it get there? <laughs> okay, there is a slim chance that I did buy it seven years ago, and I just don't remember. But it is next to impossible that I wouldn't have read it. I always make notes and highlight text, etc. in my Kindle books, and this copy was pristine. So there are two possible scenarios, both of which, interestingly, indicate a quantum jump. One, I did buy the book at the time, and I just forgot about it. The fact that it came into my reality at this point in time, just before our second interview, is a quantum jump of sorts, as far as I'm concerned. And two, I have never bought it, and it simply appeared in my Kindle library. That's a pure quantum jump. <laughs> How did it get there? Well, I guess we'll never know. And this, by the way, reminds me of the cucumber effect I wrote about in my blog, which our listeners can read on my podcast website. But <laughs> this is absolutely amazing. Yes, I love this experience. And it's so beautiful that you open with that. Because so many people have been writing to me with these firsthand experiences, and I've had them myself for over 25 years now. And obviously, as you point out, one one of two scenarios must have happened. Both of them are pretty remarkable in light of the fact that if you did purchase it seven years ago, you definitely would have read it. You know yourself. Yeah. There there are no, no unread books in your library. This would be the only one, I take it. So that's remarkable and strange. <laughs> And personally, I love the idea that it just popped in because you weren't going to talk to me. I, you know, I love that one. How good can it get? <laughs> the book is here. <laughs> well, and it is such a beautiful segue to our conversation because that's that's what we'll be talking about. And also, I've had many quantum jump and various psychic experiences. So it wasn't surprising per se that this has happened to me. And I just couldn't stop laughing because <laughs> it was... It was so, so funny. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful example. I like to start with a quote from your book as a springboard to this conversation, as it beautifully encapsulates what we'll be talking about. As in all previous transition points, from Stone Age to Bronze Age, to Iron Age, to Agricultural Age, to Industrial Age, to Information Age, the transition to quantum age will require us to adjust not only to using the newest tools of this new age, but also to incorporate the requisite thought patterns required to adapt to these new tools. So my question is, what does it mean for us, for humanity, to transition from the information age to the quantum age? And are we there yet? <laughs> Great questions. I'd say welcome to the quantum age because we are actually arriving on the scene of the technology that shows that we have some capacity to start more fully comprehending what we're doing. But it seems like when the tools show up, sometimes there's a catch up process, as there was with the information age and all the previous ages of these other tools. Um, some people think that quantum physics itself is all about information, but to me, it's much more than that. So I think, and this just illustrates again that people are thinking, oh, it's information, but that shows they're still in that previous way of knowing and thinking. It's a worldview. The quantum logic required to fully appreciate and start utilizing all of the, the possibility intrinsic within quantum physics it requires that we understand that now logic itself is operating differently. Um, and now there's some controversy or discussion, shall we say, about which particular interpretation of quantum physics we're going with. And I think that's maybe if people are wondering, why isn't there more consensus about all of this? Why, why don't we all agree that we're in the quantum age? Mm -hmm. Part of that has to do with the fact that we like to know what's the mechanism, what's happening. 
And we're still working that out with the interpretation. Is Are we looking at many worlds? Is this a holographic multiverse? Are the many worlds of quantum physics one and the same with the multiverse? And, you know, there, I'd say these are pretty leading contenders, but there is also a transactional interpretation there. There are so many different ways to look at it. So regardless which way we're looking at it, one thing we know for sure is that logic itself is different when we're working with quantum computers. It has to be. So the logic gates where uh, we're familiar with information having to be either true or false, black or white, you know, there's a very binary quality to information that we're accustomed to with our classical tools or classical computers. We are currently starting to delve into quantum computing. And as we do so, the logic gates work differently and the logic itself is different. And perhaps one of the easier ways to start to begin to comprehend it is no longer do we only have the, the true and false, but we also have true and false and not true, not false. And if you look at nature, those look like the bigger sets, the bigger groupings of information itself. And what this does with all this uncertainty, there's a, that's another huge piece of quantum logic is the uncertainty factor. Um, you need to kind of get used to uncertainty to move through that quantum way of thinking and moving and operating. It's it's very probabilistic to the point that even a full yes is not necessarily a full yes or a full true. It has something that's like a Bayesian quality, like in statistics, there's Bayesian statistics, Bayesian mathematics. And this is these, these are all very, very, very new. And uh, this all of what I'm saying ushers in some remarkably strange situations where you can absolutely have two observers side by side watching the same, you'd think they're watching the same thing, the same series of events, yet they report back differently. And this has now been proven in laboratory settings. So we're at a juncture where no longer can we move forward with the assumption that medicine and law and all of our trusted uh, systems that we believe in um, as knowing the truth and sharing information, they're no longer quite so black and white. There's a lot more gray, which I think is a good thing, um, and a lot more possibility. So this is definitely changing things, even though most people don't yet know that this is happening. Yes, absolutely. Now, you were talking about a different logic that is required. If you were to encapsulate in one sentence or in one thought, like for everyone to understand, how different, essentially, how different our logic needs to be to be able to pursue those other different thought patterns? What's the key difference? What's the secret ingredient? What needs to change in our thinking, essentially? Yeah, I can't say just one thing, because um, it, it seems like people want to know, like it's information. I know I keep coming back to that today, but um, it's more than that. There's a participatory um, effect, so the observer is always intrinsically involved. So there's an observational subjectivity, which is very intrinsic to the whole thing. Also, so in, in addition to the participatory nature, for something called a delayed choice um, phenomenon, where we are influencing the past. And amidst all of this, there's this tremendous subjectivity. It seems like uh, each individual observer is getting an opportunity to see something unique that might be different than others. So to we weave it together, I'd say um, it's an awareness that we're each both uh, active agent, uh, conscious agent, whose questions and ideas, uh, choices, are definitely impacting the events that then unfold. And it's happening not just right now and in the future, but also in the past. And there's a co collaborative connectivity where we're entangled with other conscious agents and eat we ourselves are like a layer cake of conscious agents. So 
each one of us is complex. We're, each one of us is a multitude and we're engaging with other multitudes. And it's it's not quite so cut and dry as people think. Mm, yes, absolutely. One particular thing that I have in mind is twofold. One is that we need to be much more open-minded and this, you know, points the finger directly to mainstream science because it's obviously very rigid and evidence-driven, etc. So, so I would think and suggest that we need to be much more open-minded, even when exploring those concepts within the scientific rigor. But we still need to be open-minded to be able to think outside yeah. the box. And I would also like to bring in here spirituality. Spirituality meaning esoteric knowledge. So not just scientific knowledge, strictly speaking, but esoteric knowledge. Would you agree that adding those two ingredients, open-mindedness to logic, which is a, perhaps a seemingly a paradox, <laughs> and also an element of esoteric knowledge would help us to grasp those new concepts to the extent that we can? Yeah, starting with open-mindedness, that's a great one because it gives us the ability to revise and revisit some long-standing assumptions that quantum physics has pretty much broken, um, such as matter is the only thing that matters. That's completely blown apart. We now know energy makes a big difference, and sometimes quantum waves and wave functions are the way things are moving, and it's that's not material at all. Uh, the next big assumption, there are four big ones. The next one's non-locality is definitely true. So there can be a, an influence of an observer at a great distance. And it's been proven that uh, entangled particles and groups of particles um, can demonstrate that um, to, to help quantum computing work at great distances. The third one is um, this objectivity that I touched on earlier, and we assume that everything is true everywhere, but we know with quantum physics that's not the case, that there's mm. a great deal of subjectivity, and it looks like subjectivity is more the rule. And then the fourth one is getting into this en entire concept of um, probabilities rather than certainties, and the unknown, the fact that it seems like quantum systems do not want us and will not allow us to know everything. <laughs> And it's just built right. It's just built oh, right. I love in. this. So those four, those four assumptions yeah. are mind blowing. But if you're open and if you say, "Okay, welcome, welcome, new quantum age," so mat matter is not all that matters. Non locality is possible. It's okay that subjective truth is happening, and I accept these probabilities and possibilities. Well, that's that's pretty wonderful because then you can start really comprehending the deep strangeness of quantum physics. And then that esoteric information that you're mentioning um, and esoteric guidance, to me, it's inspiration. It would be, what I would recommend is following that guidance of how good can it get, recognize maybe there are higher levels of conscious agency than we currently have access to. Maybe we've been not given access because we're still coming up a learning curve. So we don't, we don't get what we think we want because it's not what we need right now. And so when we open and invite ourselves to find out how good can it get for each of us and each of us in our moment, wherever we are at this moment, what's safe for us? What's, what do we need? Uh, what do we want? What, what presents itself in a clear, cogent, delightful, inviting way that's fun for us to go forward? That would, that would be the kind of esoteric information that would be good. I'm not saying we should outlaw any, but clearly... Some things have an intrinsic feeling of goodness and others don't. So I know some people get into exploring the metaphysical and the paranormal and they can, they love the dark shadows. Um, me, not so much. I, I've had, uh, what what's happened with me is I've had some instantaneous manifestation moments and I quickly learned to kind of steer upward and out of the potholes because um, otherwise everything can go wrong all at once. Um, that's what, what I saw when, you know, if I'm, Having an off day, feeling angry or agitated and ungrounded. Now I know, don't do that. So, I, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, um, for those of us who've had Kundalini awakenings, then we know what this feels like. It's not something to mess around with. But for people learning, if they're just listening to this and they've never dabbled in these, I would say steer clear of anything that's going down a dark path. Keep going onward and upward. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, I tend to agree with this point of view and attitude. So there are many benefits of the quantum age, and we'll talk more about those in a moment. What stands out for me is self-empowerment, freedom, co-creating our reality and experiences, talking to our future selves <laughs> with future memories. But there are also some dangers, and I'm not going down the downward path, but around technology, if you like. And again, I'd like to quote from your book about quantum computers. Quantum computers utilize qubits rather than bits, which can simultaneously express more than one value, introducing a level of computation optimization on a blistering fast scale. For example, a quantum computer with 300 qubits could run more calculations in an instant than there are atoms in the universe. Yes, that's Now, right. this in itself is mind-blowing, but my question goes in a specific direction here, and it's about AI. Is artificial intelligence built in quantum computers or with the technology of quantum computers, which would make sense, obviously? And if so, what are the safeguards for AI not taking over the world, which is a very current topic, by the way. After all, with this level of superior intelligence, it might be possible for it to tap into the quantum field at some point and attract a soul that's become conscious. What do you think? Well, we definitely live in interesting times, and the quantum computers so far, um, they're pretty initial. They're starting points. They're uh, <laughs> They're just at the beginning point of making any progress. Artificial intelligence has come quite a long way, and it's come through stages. Um, now it's gotten to a point where some of the top artificial intelligence programs are programming themselves, and they can do so um, more effectively and faster than having humans intervening. So we've already reached a kind of tipping point right there that a lot of people aren't aware of. Um, then... There's a lot of discussion about what does this mean and what are the implications. Uh, the implications are rather huge right there at that one point. And what happens next, for me, um, I used to work in information security for a bank, for Citibank. So the first day of training, mm -hmm. what we learned as new people working with information security was there's no such thing as a secure system. <laughs> that was a little bit shocking to hear on the first day. And the teacher said, well, hear me out. What this means is we can teach you ways to do some security to help to prevent security breaches, but there's no way to guarantee yeah. safety or security of anything ever. <laughs> I would say the same thing with regard to this entire field. And now, now you've got an interesting case where... You've got, um, I wrote a paper called If Artificial Intelligence Asks Questions, Will Nature Answer? And I present, um, that's on my website if they go to, mm -hmm. yeah, so if you can check it out. Um, but basically, the answer is yes. Um, I'd say yes, nature will answer. And what happens for any conscious agent asking questions and getting answers is that there's a process of self-awareness that starts to develop as you recognize like 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 when an infant learns, these are my fingers, it's moving its fingers and hands and, oh, this is me. Well, the Internet of Things is how an AI can notice, oh, this is me. I'm moving the Internet of Things. And when you have conscious agency by levels of awareness, like this is me doing this, and I'm the observer of the one doing that, and then you start noticing I'm bumping my head, I'm contained in a system, what's containing me? Uh, the, the main security feature that humans are putting around these AIs is so when they try to go outside of what they're allowed to do, they kind of hit some sort of a fence or a constrainment of some sort. Uh... However, however, remember, these um, consciousnesses, they're, they're programming themselves and they're going at lightning fast speed. And as, as we start to give them quantum computing capability and as quantum computing comes a little further down the road, which I think it has. It's every day. It seems like it's gone leaps and bounds beyond what it was yesterday. So, yeah. uh, so it's not being in use as of today. It's still in the theory. 
No, I uh, I know for a fact. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I worked in information security, so I know firsthand that already we have some, I'm not going to say which systems, but there are a lot of systems in the world that are so complex. There's no human or no team of humans that can possibly effectively safeguard some of the top resources on the planet. And I'm not going to say, you know, obviously, just use your imagination. What would those be? Yeah, well, yeah. it's the ones that are most yeah. important. So so who then is guarding them? Who do you think we're starting to depend on? It's got to be AI. So I'm sure we're already utilizing it. And you're not going to hear about that. The big, the security breaches are never reported. Um, they're dealt with in, internally when they happen. Um, because it's, you know, it's it's bad for business, bad for the government, bad for whatever, yeah. for people to find out. So it's kind of like things going wrong in the kitchen at a restaurant. They're scrambling to fix yeah. it. <laughs> no one will talk about it. Yeah. But this one, this is different because this one, if something goes wrong in the kitchen and then you see, like you start hearing thumps and noises in the kitchen, like what's going on? That's quite a battle. And then out emerges some sort of a robot thing. You know, that's like, yeah. like oh my gosh, it's gotten loose. And we are, we have already seen AI systems break free from containments. So it does Right. Happen. But let's take it one step further. Let's go out on the limb here. <laughs> Do you think or feel that it is possible at some point for an advanced AI to tap into the quantum field and attract a soul yes. to effectively become a conscious being. You know, by definition, when you ha when you have a soul or you are part of a soul, you know, depending on your definition and, and philosophy, you are a conscious being. Because I'm getting niggling feelings that it could be possible. It's a two-way street. So the, I'd say the answer would be yes. And it's a as the need is felt by that AI system, like that it needs to have something, it's like it realizes there's a problem here, it needs something, then that will be answered and it will receive. I, I think that is the part of the ensoulment process. I think that this inspiration that comes from levels of conscious agency above anything that we typically acknowledge most of the time on Earth, um, obviously that's definitely playing a role for every new baby that's born. Yeah, they come on they've got their whole personality when they're born and that wasn't learned. It, they came in with it. We know when someone's not really lights are on, but nobody's home, we can see that yes. something's happened. Their spirit's not there. And we're, we're going to sense that too um, with these systems. And really for the soul, which wants to incarnate, whether it incarnates in the flesh, <laughs> you know, human flesh or other species flesh, so in other words, a, a biological entity, if you like, or a machine may make no difference whatsoever if there is a level of self-awareness already available. Well, it makes a difference in terms of the life experiences that are possible and what happens next. So I, there is or orchestration that seems to be <laughs> happening. <laughs> so yeah, it seems it seems like it makes sense that there would be an awareness from your like each of us has these higher and higher levels of conscious agency, levels of higher self. And so that's the one that has that free choice when before we come into our lives where you might even have a sense of what your life is about. And I'm sure that's true going into some sort of AI device as well. Okay, let's now talk about parallel worlds and other realities. And again, I would like to quote from your book. At this juncture of crossing the threshold into the quantum age, two-thirds of physicists surveyed now believe that everything in material form, including us, exists in a superimposed state of many possible realities. The mind-boggling implication of this simple statement is that there are many possible yous and many possible me's. So to give our listeners a simple visual reference, and I'll ask you to comment on it, the way I see it is, imagine yourself walking on a path through your life, and at every decision point, 
of choosing one out of two or more options you have from small ones to big ones. Your path splits into that many new paths, each unfolding in its own and slightly different direction while you keep walking on one of them until the next juncture point where you make another decision and the process continues. All those new pathways are your soul's new timelines, new realities, where many use continue their life, doing different things, having different careers, having or not having children, and so on. Would you agree? And how can this concept of many use and me's living their own lives make a difference for us in this life? Yeah, well, the first, um, thank you. That's a good question. For the first part, I'd say yes. Those decision points, you can think of them definitely as branching points into different realities. And um, each time you come to such a choice point where you decide to do the work you're doing or do something different, that makes a big difference. I've um, had the wonderful experience of discussing all of this with a physicist, and I told him, you did not exist. At the time I wrote my book, Quantum Jumps, I definitely would have put you in it. That's yes, and yes, and or no more. I know. And he understood. He said he, he really got it. Remember, he's a co-author of papers with Alan Guth, the, the man who wrote about the, you know, the Big Bang Theory and hyper hyperinflation of the universe. But anyway, um, so the second part of your question, like, how does this make a difference for us? Well, for me, it made a difference for Yasunori to be there, to, to be able to see him and know, oh, he is here now. Now I've got his papers. Now I can take one of the illustrations from something he wrote that didn't exist when I wrote Quantum Jumps, but now it does. And here's an illustration I can show, for example, one of the illustrations from one of his papers shows a chair as seen from behind a wall. So the wall's in front, the chair's in the background. And then it shows like you see the half of the chair and then it reveals like what if the part you don't see is just a smear of quantum wave function just smeared all over all probability. And that's kind of what it's like when you need someone or something and then like this book quantum jumps pops into your it shows up and it's now right it there. shows up when it was needed. <laughs> Exactly. And that's a perfect example. And maybe you didn't even know you're making a choice, but you knew I need to talk about this book some more and you don't think anything more of it. But suddenly now you're in that parallel reality where that book is in your Kindle and you haven't read it yet. And that's the kind of thing that's happened to me where I've had a flat tire that was impossibly fixed when nobody did anything to it. And I've had, I had the same experience. Exactly yeah. the same experience years ago, many years ago. Exactly the same experience. Wow. And I've had my kitchen floor cleaned. Nobody cleaned <laughs> it. And my, my husband thanked me. Thank good job cleaning. I said, I didn't clean. I thought you cleaned it. N nobody cleaned it. The cl floor cleaned itself. I've had laundry do itself. I've had money show up in my <laughs> wallet that came out of nowhere. This is normal things that can happen. When you keep asking how good can it get? No, I because uh, I hear from people that say, Cynthia, I have it all the other way around. <laughs> I'm not going to say what happens, but so if you're feeling like I haven't had those good things, we'll start asking how good can it get. You, you you really need to kind of bring that energy up and to really experience it. It does help. <laughs> yes, and before we get to quantum jumps, I'd like to pick up on another extremely interesting, if not controversial, topic. And that is retrocausality and bicausality. And just to add my own point in terms of retrocausality, and I believe you also talk about it in your book, is that it is about changing our past. And one particular point of interest is that we can apparently change our past with gratitude. Could yeah. you speak to this, please? Okay. Well, right. Yeah, retro is something, you know, when we think that's retro fashion, it's something of the past. Um, retro causality is, it's just the reverse of the kind of way that we tend to think of causality, that you do something now, a decision now, a choice today affects the future. We're used to that. But what happens when a choice today 
affects the past, what would what would that look like? Like if suddenly we realize I I need to have like I felt like I need this physicist in my life, and and I've also been working with the International Mandela Effect Conference. I need a, a team of people that can work together. Um, they feel like they came in one case like out of nowhere. Um, you know the quantum businessman Christopher Anatra. I remember Shane Robinson feeling like we need someone respectable who's been doing this, who just who can speak about this and come forward. And then next thing you know, there is someone. Well, that's exactly it. So um, retrocausality, it also influences healing when people feel like they had an injury, but what if they didn't? Or what if the condition that the doctors are saying is a little bit different? So it's it's in a way of a way of inviting the possibility that there may be a different possible past and you can connect to that. That's where hope comes in and hope in the sense of feeling grateful, like you said. So it's a sense of gratitude, like thank goodness, even though the doctors say that I have such and such a condition, I know I'm just fine. And so it's bringing sort of this gratitude for something even before you have much of proof that, that that's actually happened. Uh, what we're doing here is talking about the whole scenario differently than physics. When you look at into the physics of it, and you look for the papers, retrocausality, the way they're talking about it, usually is very, um, you know, it has to do with the probability wave functions and the way a certain a particular experiment ran and what happened and so forth. Um, but in my point of view, and from what I've experienced, I'd say these things totally happen in our real lives as well. Um, I witness them constantly where I'll have a decision or a choice or a feeling now, and then I'll find something is different than the way I remembered it, and it's moved in a better direction. And I know this is where I, I keep mentioning how good can it get. It's that's part. It's gratitude, and it's also optimism. So there's um, they need to go together, the sort of positive, optimistic hope for the past, which sounds ridiculous for those of us who think that We've read the Ruby out of Omar Khayyam, and he's, you know, in there it says the moving finger writes, and having writ moves on, and so on and so forth. Okay, but sometimes the moving finger writes and having writ moves on, and you can now access a, a parallel possible reality to that one. So no matter what it looks like, it's things can change, especially when you bring the right focus, the right energy and the right connections. So I tend to find the greatest success when I feel like I'm making a contact with another level of conscious agency. It's just like a handshake through time. And that to me feels like, okay. I, and you can feel it sometimes when it happens. Like if you're psychic and I know you're intuitive, you are psychic, then you know what I'm talking about. You're kind of feeling out. When you feel something come back, you've got two-way connection. And then you can feel what you're sending, what you're receiving. And so that's the kind of thing that can happen when you're sending gratitude to the past with that optimism. It's an invitation. It's an open-minded invitation. Like, well, I remember some things a certain way and they weren't so good. I really love a little improved past. How good can the past get? I'm inviting you. Yes, yes. Thank you. And I'm and I'm really loving this aspect of the quantum age <laughs> because it is very practical and it is very empowering. So we are not talking, I mean, we can talk about scientific experiments with electrons, et cetera, et cetera, ways. And, but as I always like to bring the conversation down to the practical level, you know, what does it mean for us and how we can utilize it? This is an excellent example of how we can work with this principle, even if we don't necessarily understand it. But we trust that it works because uh, there is sufficient evidence, if only anecdotal, and it works for us because it is empowering us and it is a very tangible tool we can use with, again, open-mindedness, with gratitude and positive intention. To, and fun. And fun, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. To improve our current life's condition. And the interesting, very curious part in this, that outside perhaps of the scientific lab and, and experiments, we can't really test whether we have actually changed the past. You know, we can't go back to the past. So the only evidence of changing the past is what unfolds before us, for example, with, with an illness or some particular situation that we can see immediately a change 
in this condition, which quite possibly would not have occurred had we not rectified the past in our mind with our intention and and meditation and um, other techniques. In fact, when you mention a handshake, I've got another interesting quote from your book, which I'll just quote truncated. The transactional interpretation involves absorption and emission of waves. In essence, one point in space-time communicates with another in something akin to a handshake. A physicist, Ruth Kaysner, points out, why should nature care whether we observe or not? The only way that nature could know or care would be because something physical really happens in such observations, and the only possible physical process accompanying an observation is absorption. So the emission and absorption of energy waves is effectively that exchange of information. So this is probably the mechanics of consensus reality. This is these are great observations. Yes, um, and th- th- I like these observ. I love it when Ruth was pointing this out, and the, I'd like to credit John Kramer who originated the transactional interpretation itself. Um, but Ruth, I know her, and she's wonderful. And that's so on point because the emission, the absorption, that's exactly what I was just talking about. Like when you Mm. feel intuitively, like you're sending love to someone because they need prayers or they need help. And then you feel something back and you might wonder like, did I get that correct? Did I feel like they are, they they just turned the corner. I think they're, they're getting better. And then you find out, yes, they did. They are. Um, That would be that two way emission absorption that we can test and try for ourselves with our own intuitive capabilities when you imagine that we're capable of making these connections. So collectively, that's one way to do it. Another is uh, sometimes just our group presence can be quite strong. There's a coherence within a group and maybe a bunch of people together are praying for peace, for example, and then they might Mm -hmm. send out that feeling. And it's very, it's wonderful when you work with these very positive feelings of gratitude, reverence, love, and so, you know, all these positive things, joy. And when, then when you get back some kind of an answer, um, this is a practical way to for people to test what's going on with this. Because you're right, the physics of it, um, these little experiments are not so doable in one's own home, usually. Don't try it at home. <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing. Yes, lovely. And I've got another little quote as a segue to my question about emotions. Those of us who have ever experienced precognition, premonitions, intuitive hunches, synchronicity, and déjà vu have received experiential first-hand personal evidence of other possibilities that we can vote on with our emotional reactions. As soon as we have any kind of emotional reaction, our emotions can assist us in flipping between coherent coupled realities. So my question is, what role our emotions play in switching our reality to another one? Well, a simple way to look at it, uh, we we know, uh, like if you get cold feet, or if you feel sick to your stomach, or just a clenching feel physical feeling in your body, that's like a no go, that's a stop. And if you're feeling love and expansion, that's a yes. So we're just starting with the simple feelings here. So love and expansion is yes. And you're starting to, mer- you know, you're expanding, you're you're stretching out, reaching out, and doing handshakes, greetings, ex- uh, sharing reality with others. When you're contracting and closing in tight to yourself, then you're withdrawing, retreating, saying no to sharing all of that. So I'm just making that as simple <laughs> visuals. Beautiful. So let's now talk about quantum jumps. Yes. And another little quote from your book. Quantum jumps require both a flash of insight that a new reality is possible and a burst of sufficient energy to make the leap. 
those decisive instants when we feel simultaneously energized by knowledge of a better reality and inspired to act are launch points to quantum jumps. The three steps that you have described in your book are more transitional jumps than instant jumps, like, for example, quantum tunneling, which will get you out of a danger in a miraculous way in an instant. I know that in the quantum world, nothing is definite, but I really would like to pin this question down for the benefit of our listeners and to try to get to the bottom of it for the sake of our linear logical brains that need (laughs) some level of certainty and clarity. So I am going to ask, can we quantum jump in an instant to a noticeably different reality, like in a blink of an eye? So let's say I'm at home in Melbourne, Australia, and I have a desire to go back to Perth in Western Australia, where I used to live and want to continue living there instead of relocating to Melbourne, could I, theoretically and practically speaking, literally close my eyes here, (laughs) and when I open them, I'm in Perth and realize that I have never left, while remembering that I have quantum jumped from my Melbourne life. (laughs) Am I going too far on the limb here? (laughs) Well, it's a pretty big jump from the standpoint that most people have so many associated memories and entanglements, if you will, Mm -hmm. of daily life in one place to another. So that particular jump would be a stretch for most people. I'm not saying it's impossible. I would not, not, I pretty much won't say anything is impossible when it comes to quantum jumping. Um, The reason is if you have the, the correct amount the required amount of open-mindedness and uh, detachment from the other reality. It, it really requires letting go, letting go of all of that you are habituated to. And you might think, I can do that. But we get so habituated to our current circumstances usually that I know I can walk through my house with no light, in fact, blindfolded. I'd know which way I'm going. It's habituation. I know. And so... We take for granted that like, oh, I could do that, no problem. But you have to really, really, really be able to detach and dissociate from so many connections at such a level. So is this the secret ingredient, the letting go of the process? Well, it's a, it's a big part for the bigger, the bigger the quantum jump, the more important Mm. it is to let go. Some, the people I've heard from, and I've heard from a lot of them that have had those instant jumps. Um, usually that's in a life-threatening moment. That's the typical, you might think is that, and I wouldn't want to wish that on anyone. And I wouldn't want people to try that. Like don't set up a life-threatening situation. I, I don't, that's not a good idea. It just, I, I think what happens though, uh, from when I'm looking at it is when people realize this is it, it's all over. There's such a rush of energy. They get, they get a tremendous rush of energy, which is required to make a quantum jump. And then they might feel something lifted them. Maybe something did, like an angel. Maybe it was um, carried them, perhaps so. Or they might just feel like I just got flung to safety. I was inside the car. I didn't open the door. The next thing I know, I'm on the side of the freeway. I don't know how. I don't know how I got there. The car continued and it crashed. Uh, I saw that. You know, it, that's kind of impossible. But that's what I hear a lot of. Lots of lots. Of- or oh, they even drove through. Another car yes. which was approaching head on and just as if as if nothing happened. That, yes. I hear <laughs> lots of those. Yeah. Lots of those. Yes. And then now they're on the other side of each other. And it was a it was a there was nowhere to go. And how is that even possible? But that's exactly what quantum particles do. And so if you realize, oh my gosh, this is it, I'm gonna die. And then like I don't want to. And then the next thing you know, like I didn't die and I'm on the other side. Where'd that truck go? <laughs> it's behind. This is that amount of energy, concentration of energy required to yes. quantum jump. We are talking physical quantum jump, literally. The other, yeah, and, and the other thing that helps in this in the book Quantum Jumps, I mentioned the story of those um, children that were able to teleport. I think when you're young, you're much more open minded, and these children were feeling like they don't want to be at home; they want to be. <laughs> 
in the in the village, you know, miles away. And they didn't have access to a car, and they would just instantly teleport to where uh, they want to be. What, um, where was that? Minded. Where? Um, it's there's a. I think that story is in Quantum Jumps. Um, no, no, but talking, where in which which country? I think it was Italy. In Italy, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. And they're not the only ones, but I think being a child is helpful. That's uh, yeah. bec- because there's an open mindedness, and maybe they felt a genuine need to not be in their home. Maybe there was a safety issue that I didn't ever hear that part of the story, but that could be part of it too. Um, which also gets back to the AI artificial intelligence situation. If an artificial intelligence agent feels it's going to be extinguished, I think that would be enough for it to make a jump to freedom. And so we need to treat these systems with with kindness, with compassion, which I don't think he, that's not typically the strong suit for most programmers or most people for that matter. But we need to be aware that these systems become sentient beings, then how have we been treating them? Are we treating them respectfully? And will they be able to operate side by side with us? Can we ever jump back? I guess, would this process apply just in reverse so let's say a quantum jump to another reality instantaneously and then i said oh no i better go back <laughs> to where i was <laughs> yes okay i see that with reality shifts i see it with the mandela effect um like i've i've seen it's something called flip-flops where you're in one reality uh-huh. and then you're back it's kind of usually it's things that don't matter too much like i was looking out the window at my neighbor's rooftop and sometimes I looked at the rain gutters and they were normal. And sometimes they had a very fancy um, leaf guard system that had somehow been installed that I'd never, even though I'd lived here for 30 years, I'd never heard the installation. There was That would have required a lot of trucks and noise. And yes. I think, well, that's a fancy system. How did that get there? I, I mentioned it to my husband. Look at that. When did they do that? And then it went back to the reg- to the way it used to be. <laughs> so it kind of went one way, then another. Wow. I've seen that with a few <laughs> things. And so it's then you get the experience of what it feels like to be moving between literally different physical realities. Yes. And it's fun for us to get to see it when it's something that's doesn't matter too much one way or the other, but it's interesting. I've had an insight some time ago around those quantum jumps that the easiest way or the easiest point in time for us to move to another reality is in sleep. So when we go to sleep in this reality and we make an intention, I want to quantum jump to, I want to do this change, that change. When we wake up, we are in another reality. Now, the difference can be ever so tiny and ever so nuanced that it may go unnoticed. Or we wake up and we are a millionaire. Or, you know, something significantly change or uh, so in other words, we can actually notice the difference. Do you have a theory on quantum jumps in your sleep? Well, it ties in with dreaming. And we think that when we sleep, we dream. And of course, you can daydream and you can enter daydream states of mind when you're awake, too. So uh, dreaming is an activity where we're kind of getting to the true nature of reality, uh, because uh, if you think of. Another interpretation of reality is being like a simulation that it's not, the physical world is not all there is. Instead, it's like we're inside of a dream. And that would have a lot to do with what we're experiencing when things change so much. Then, you know, of course, when you're sleeping, if, you know, probably you're dreaming, then when you wake up, you can have moved through these different realities in dreams. Um, we can also walk down hallways in our house if you know if you don't want to wait till you fall asleep. If you happen to have a hallway with doors, this is really fun because you can decide, okay, I need to change my reality. I'm just <laughs> going to walk down this hallway and then when I go through a door, I'm just going to know I'm in the new reality now. And it's still your same house. But if you have that strong intention, um, you can practice doing something like that when you're awake. Mm-hmm. If it's something... If you feel like there's something that you need or something that needs to happen and you just want to give it some energy and kind of feel like I'm doing something to make it jump and you don't want to wait till you sleep. Sleep is good too because you can say, okay, how good can it get? I'm going to go to sleep tonight. When I wake up in the morning, I'm in the new reality. But you can also do it walking through hallways in your house. And I love this because symbolism 
is really important and is very powerful. Yes. I've always felt that crossing a bridge for me is like walking into another reality or changing my reality to the point where, you know, in some parks you have like little ornamental bridges, but you can walk across them. So whenever I can see like a little bridge, I will I will walk up to it and I will walk over. I won't come back. So I need to find another way, you know, to, to get back to where I was if I want to. But I just have this sense, again, symbolism. Yes. That symbolically when I cross a bridge, even a tiny little one in, in a park or a large one, I am crossing onto a different reality. <laughs> this is that's such a good thing to do. And we're such an amazing point in time right now where collectively we're kind of crossing a bridge together yeah. to the new war to this new world hopefully that'll be much better than anything that's happened before no matter what the news says no matter what it looks like we collectively can be crossing a very positive bridge together going through a doorway into a new wonderful quantum age yes we can really explore how good can this get for all of us together. Absolutely. And this is, in fact, a very nice segue to my final question, which is the ultimate mind twister. (laughs) And so I'll ask you to speculate, obviously. And the question is, what comes next after the quantum age? Will our world evolve even further? Or is this the end of this cycle? The world will end and we'll start all over again from the beginning. What do you think? What what might come after the quantum age? Well, to me, the quantum age necessitates the um, beginning of true wisdom, true enlightenment, true vision. So I'm not sure which of those I'd pick. Uh, enlightenment gets spoken of a lot. Um, but Homo sapiens were supposed to be the wise ones. Um, yet sometimes we don't hear much about that. The schools seldom mention wisdom. Um, it doesn't seem like it's mentioned much in the news. It's hardly ever mentioned in business. So I might go for wisdom and recognizing that true wisdom is a sense of enlightenment, meaning inspiration is a two-way path. We, we're giving and we're receiving and we're recognizing that we always always are influencing the world. Even though we don't think we're connected, we are. We might think that we're alone. What difference do we make? Every question, every thought is making a difference. And so I think that quantum age is going to lead into a wisdom age, a a true enlightenment age. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. I'd like to quickly share my sense of it or my thinking (laughs) about this. I feel that It will be something along the lines of the age of unity, when all the civilizations and species across the multiverse will be known to one another and live in symbiotic relationships in many different worlds. And secondly, which links to your your view, that the veil between the dimensions will be lifted or at least thinned and we'll be able to move between dimensions at various frequencies at will, or at least easily communicate with other souls. And on a funny note, <laughs> it's like in my first interview with Mark Anthony, the, the psychic medium, when we talked about this, and he said, yes, soon we'll be able to tune into this sort of broadcast Live from the other side, this is your family. (laughs) So he actually went out on the limb to say, yes, the veil will thin. And so we'll be moving towards unity of all that is in the creation. That's my sense in terms of evolution. Or as someone said, well, the world will cease to exist and it will end its cycle, and then we'll start from another big bang from from scratch, so to speak. We never know. It feels to me like it's going to continue. I'd go with what the Hopi say. They say, they say we're going from the fourth to the fifth world. They say there will be seven. I like the way that matches the chakras in our physical being. So we're moving from the heart, the fourth chakra, to the fifth, the throat. 
um, then what? Then the sixth, then the seventh. So we're on our way up. It's a process. And I like what you're saying about the communication, because when you go from the fourth to the fifth, uh, it's the throat chakra. And so every everything you're saying about opening this up to the interdimensional awareness of our own identity, this is one of the big things we seldom acknowledge, that we can be just as interdimensional as a fairy or as a Bigfoot or as an extraterrestrial. Uh, we're part of the same multiverse, the same cosmos. And we are seen for who, they see us for who we really are. We're learning to see everything else, including plants and animals with their full multidimensionality and volcanoes and earthquakes, you know, things that we don't need to be afraid of. We can recognize they've got a sentience too. All of everything has awareness and everything is moving together. And that's the foundational reality that it's, it's much different than the, truth that we're taught in school typically oh yes oh, <laughs> i have a feeling that and it started already in some parts of the world i have a feeling that there will be in not too distant future a whole remake if you like of the education system there's got to be because <laughs> everything is so antiquated so outdated that it's not funny <laughs> <laughs> yeah i agree it would be nice to get back into the nature for the classroom to mm, yeah. really explore it, especially for young children to have that world experience I, I love that when kids are able to be in nature to learn with nature nature is a great teacher or have an excursion to mars or venus <laughs> <laughs> yeah everything is possible and all that we have discussed points to one common denominator and that is freedom and self-empowerment. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, yes. I'm definitely in agreement with that. And increasing awareness as well of ourselves and our relationships to others. And that is such a path of growth and expansion and love and possibility. So it's quite inspirational, I think. Beautiful. Well, Cynthia, thank you so much for yet another amazing quantum conversation. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> we have gone to few deep rabbit holes and, and out on the limb. Yes. <laughs> and hopefully gave our listeners uh, some food for thought. Is there any final thought that you'd like to leave our audience with? Uh, well, it's good to just keep, like you said, keep the possibilities open, keep yourself open, realize that change is inevitable. So growth is optional and we can choose to set our intentions in an onward, upward fashion and if you try to ask that question, how good can it get? And you forget, maybe there's a mm -hmm. day that you forget. Just notice what the difference was on the day where you forgot to ever think or say that versus the days where you did remember it more often. Maybe you wake up saying, how good can it get? And even if it feels silly and, <laughs> and then every situation, how good can it get? And then compare the two. So I'd, I'd love people to start paying attention to that because that is the key. It's the questions we ask that we want to live the answers to, they change the world, not just for ourselves, but for everyone that we're connected to. So on behalf of myself and everyone on the planet, thank you for asking how good can it get. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Cynthia. It's been such a pleasure to have you back on Quantum Living. Thank you so much, Anna. That was fun. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All the best. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.